Civil Liberties, Chapter 4. We're diving into our examination then of the Constitution, right? Because civil liberties, as we're going to see, are the sum total of the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights are the first ten amendments to the Constitution. So really we're looking at the Constitution when we say civil liberties. Now, I'm going to introduce the seminar question now, and we'll come back at the end of the class as we want to do and develop a thesis statement out of it, right? Our examination of civil liberties helps us appreciate the balance of power that is codified in the Constitution. So this is the prompt. Right? This is the setup for the question. The real question comes with how does the existence and exercise of civil liberties show evidence of structural and procedural balance of power and of pluralism? And so we're looking for civil liberties, structural and procedural balance of power, and pluralism. So in your thesis statement, I would expect to see all three elements, right? And if you can somehow throw in the, the idea of the social contract. Remember, I made such a big deal that the Constitution is the codification of the social contract. If you would be able to throw that into your thesis statement, boy, that would just say volumes about how much you really appreciate what the Constitution is. So again, what is the Constitution? What are civil liberties? What is structural and procedural balance? We touched on that the first night. And pluralism. All right? So your thesis statement should be fairly straightforward. These three slash four elements should drive your outline. So if you have two and a half to three pages with four main elements, not including your introductory paragraph and your concluding paragraph, I would argue it's roughly two paragraphs each ish. Maybe one and a half paragraphs, right? Or a good paragraph and two smaller paragraphs. You get the idea. You're going to need to find yourself editing significantly to fit it all in. So again, you know that old um, trick that we all done, right? When you increase your introductory, uh, your Mike Corelli, Paul's 120, you know, the day, the classroom, you know, the weather that day. If you have all that going on in your header, Something's really wrong. You should be wanting to just put your name on it so that you can squeeze and get as much in as possible. Again, if you find yourself stretching, something's wrong. You should be finding yourself having to cut, having to edit to get it all in. Okay? Just a tip. So everybody's finished pretty much writing now. You saw that I was kind of killing time while everybody got this down. And so our agenda today is to look at the Bill of Rights in historical context as we want to do, right? starting with Founders' Intent. We're going to look briefly at the role of the courts vis-a-vis -vis civil liberties or the Bill of Rights. We're going to look at the Incorporation Doctrine, which is the 14th Amendment. So it's not one of the Bill of Rights, but in incorporates the Bill of Rights to the states. We're going to look at preferred freedoms. We're going to have the First Amendment in depth examined. We're going to spend quite a bit of time on the First Amendment. And then, as time permits, we'll tailor it, but we'll do two through eight. Nine and ten, we'll reiterate. We touched on that when we did chapter two. And then we'll reintroduce the seminar question and craft, together craft a thesis statement. The Bill of Rights in historical context. So the Bill of Rights as a body, the first ten amendments, create the structure of civil liberties within the U.S. political system. Civil liberties are the individual legal and constitutional protections against government encroachment. So we remember briefly the context of the Bill of Rights. It resulted from the Federalist Anti-Federalist debate. Right? We said that during the ratification process, there was such contention between these two factions of government that the resulting compromise was to go ahead and append a Bill of Rights once the Constitution was ratified. In other words, this is the Anti-Federalists' victory. This is what the Anti-Federalists won by virtue of their participation in the debate. So, if you can remember that, that this is the Anti-Federalists' trophy, then think of it with Anti-Federalist eyes. What were the Anti-Federalists most afraid of? an overly strong, overly powerful central government that would trample upon individual and eventually states' rights. 
So it's not surprising then that the Bill of Rights are meant to limit the power of an overly strong government. Originally, as I said, the national government. What are the differences then between civil liberties and civil rights? Civil rights. Now it's so confusing because we call the first ten amendments the Bill of Rights, and they are, there are elements of civil rights in them. But as a body, they create civil liberties. So what is the difference then between civil liberties and civil rights? Civil liberties are the protections of the individual against the overly strong power of government. Civil rights are the guarantee of your place at the political table. Normally, this means franchise. So franchise is the right to vote. So if you're talking about the right to vote, you're talking about civil rights. Right? It's your place at the political table. But wait a minute. If we think about democracy and pluralism and the intent of democracy and pluralism, couldn't you argue that if I try to stop you from participating in a political campaign, not just voting, but if I try to stop you from participating in a campaign, that in effect, that would also limit your civil rights? In order to participate fully in the political discussion, would you argue that you should have access to information about the system, information about the candidates? This comes along with education. If I were to, for example, have my YouTube clips up, and only my YouTube clips, and a person who had a physical inability to use that medium, would I, in effect, be limiting their civil rights, their place at the political table? If they can't have access to all the information that everybody else has, then I'm trampling on their civil rights, their place at the table, that everybody gets a place at the table. Everybody's treated with fairness in the eyes of the law civil rights. Civil liberties, protections against your individual liberties. Civil rights, the assurance that you have a place at the table. Where do these rights originate? Well, there's a significant difference between the English system and the American system as defined in the Constitution. And this is by virtue primarily of the age of enlightenment ideals and the philosophers that we've been talking about all along. Locke, Rousseau, Montesquieu, they argued that these are natural-born rights, rights inherent in us as human beings, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In the American political system, governments are instituted to secure these rights. Government's job, then, is to make sure that your rights are upheld. They're naturally occurring rights. They're inherent. In the English system of government, your rights are given to you by the king because the king is sovereign. Now, you may think that this is you know, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, but really, if you think about it, it's the people who are creating the government, not the government who are creating the people. If civil liberties, then, are meant to protect us from a government, we're talking about our natural rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So those are the rights that are being protected by civil liberties. Now, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is very broad. As we're going to see, we have freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, right? the due process, the right against self-incrimination, the right to trial by jury. All these are going to be considered part of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Are they essential for democracy? Oh, you betcha. Democracy the vibrant marketplace of ideas, pluralism, right? Where we want to make sure that everybody has equal access, everybody has their voice. That if we limit so much as one person's voice in the political system, that conversation is lessened, right? In other words, if we say everybody can have participation except for women, then the conversation is so much less for having cut off 51% of the population, right? Or Catholics, or blacks or people over 65, or those who don't own property. You get the idea, right? So civil liberties are essential for democracy because they assure that we have that freedom of expression, that freedom to participate, that pluralism. I wanted to make a quick caveat. I talk a lot about founders' intent. And we have to just clarify for a moment that the founders aren't just the 55 gentlemen who were at the Constitutional Convention. Not all of them were there all the time. Heck, Thomas Jefferson was ambassador to France. John Adams was ambassador to England. They weren't even in the Constitutional Convention. Patrick Henry 
didn't attend. He smelt a rat, remember? Samuel Adams and Walton Smith didn't attend. These were patriots. These were considered part of the founding generation, part of the founding fathers. So when I say founding fathers or founding generation, I want to tell you that it's a very broad definition. All the people who influenced the founding generation. John Adams may not have been there, but you bet your bottom dollar he was writing letters. Right? He was getting his two cents in, and was, as was Thomas Jefferson. As was Abigail Adams. Right? They were all having this great conversation through correspondence. So this idea that founders, the founding generation or the founding fathers was limited to the guys who were at the Constitutional Convention is a misnomer. Well, this is important. Because where do a lot of these ideas about civil liberties come? Through pluralism. The anti-federalists. For the most part, weren't at the Constitutional Convention. The birth of the Bill of Rights is by virtue of people who weren't even there. So if you're talking about uh, Noam Chomsky or Howard Zinn, you know, and you're looking f at this idea that it was a system of government formed by the elite for the elite to serve the elite, I would argue the opposite by virtue of so many people participating in the conversation. In the United States, the role of the courts is very important in determining what the Constitution means when we say freedom of speech, determining what the Constitution means with the Establishment Clause, as we're going to see, determining what the Constitution means in the Second Amendment, interpreting the Constitution in today's civil society. So although civil liberties are set down in the Bill of Rights, it's the role of the courts to be the final arbiters about what those liberties are because they determine what the Constitution means. As your textbook suggests, the American people are great supporters of civil liberties in theory. But when the rubber meets the road, when actual application happens, oftentimes they falter or their support falters. So can I give you an example? The Westboro Baptist Church. Summer, there was a Supreme Court case where the Westboro Baptist Church fought for their rights to what they do is picket funerals. Picket funerals of fallen soldiers, fallen um, uh, service people. They also picket funerals of you know, children um, who were killed. I think there was a bus accident where a number of children were killed. Any, really any time they can use to get airtime. Their message, you, may, you know who I'm talking about, the Westboro Baptist Church? They allow gays in them. And beyond, right, that we're a godless country and that we're doomed to be, okay. The idea is, though, even though what the Westboro Baptist Church is anathema is distasteful to the great majority of people in the United States, I'm not really talking about their message. I'm talking about the reaction of the majority against a very, very small minority. It's the courts who determine what the Constitution means. And when the Constitution says freedom of speech, the court found, no, that includes Westboro Baptist Church. Even though what they're saying may be very distasteful, nevertheless, the intent of the founding generation was freedom of speech. So they get to do it. Now, this is the hue and cry that erupted nationwide among the population when this court case, this court case was settled. Oh, my gosh. You, know, you would think that the world was falling because people who normally support the idea of freedom of speech do so in theory. But when the practical application comes and it's somebody who's speaking who they disagree with, oftentimes our support falters. This is just political science. This is the way people act. People, As I said, the Bill of Rights are the first 10 amendments and they apply to the central government. The anti-federalists didn't conceive these Bill of Rights being applied to the states. Most of the states had their own Bill of Rights in their constitutions already. Actually, that's where the idea of the Bill of Rights came from. It wasn't until the 14th Amendment, which was one of the Civil War Amendments, that the Bill of Rights was applied to the states. In other words, a state couldn't limit your freedom of speech. A state couldn't establish a state religion. And so it had to do then with the newly freed slaves and equal protection and due process of law guaranteed in the Constitution. So it was applying those civil liberties to the states primarily with the newly freed slaves in mind so that the states can use their power to harass or to mess with the legitimate liberty of the former slaves after the Civil War. But the 14th Amendment then in 1868 means, and it wasn't really applied until the early 1900s, that the idea of the states being limited by the same constitutional principles is relatively new. It wasn't in the founders' intent. The founders' intent didn't include protections of the states. It, this was all about the central government. 
What happens, though, when these many freedoms come into conflict? You know, we have due process, we have trial by jury, we have the right to a speedy trial, we have the prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. We have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press. Are there such a thing, is there such a thing as a preferred freedom? So that if these freedoms come in conflict, is there one yardstick that we can apply in all cases? And there are. The courts have found that the preferred freedoms are those freedoms that are found in the First Amendment. The First Amendment's freedom of religion, speech, press, assembly, and the petition for redress are their preferred freedoms against which all the others must bow first. So if you have right to a speedy trial or right to a trial by jury, if there is an element of freedom of speech or freedom of religion that might be challenged by that other right, how that would, but it would be the First Amendment that would come first. Freedom of speech is the, the intention of freedom of speech is to protect speech criticizing government. As we're going to see, there are ways to limit freedom of speech, commercial speech, symbolic speech, that we're going to be talking about. They're listed in your book. But the preferred freedoms are always going to be the First Amendment freedoms, the one that came straight out of the gate. What is this First Amendment? Now, you've done your reading, and you know this better than I, but it reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And I really want to draw you to this. I know you're going to think I'm crazy. This semicolon is everything, especially when you begin to talk about the Second Amendment and the absence of that semicolon, because it creates a new thought. This, then, this first part is a complete thought. The semicolon goes on to the next complete thought, that these two aren't related in and amongst themselves, that the idea of establishing a religion and prohibiting the free exercise isn't necessarily clued into freedom of speech or freedom of the press. These are two different thoughts. So, shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press, semicolon, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So, we're going to tackle this and we're going to tear it apart and slice it and dice it like nobody's business, but before we do, I want to go back just for a moment to social contract theory. Because remember, the Constitution is the codification of the social contract. It is the written con social contract, yes? So how does the First Amendment serve the social contract? Well, I would argue that there are four key elements. An educational function, a safety valve function, truth-seeking function, and the social obligation function. First, educational function. So when you look at freedom of speech or freedom of the press or the right to assemble, what you're talking about is the idea of advancing knowledge and the potential for self-fulfillment through communication, right? Or through the free practice of religion, or not, right? And having the fullness of religion out there, whatever possible combinations of religion there may be, that would help make you self-fulfilled. We want the greatest, the broadest expression possible. So the First Amendment, specifically, contributes to the education of the electorate through sharing ideas, through sharing knowledge, and allowing for the fullest potential. The second one is the safety valve function. So you know a steam engine has a safety valve, right? So the, the pressure builds too greatly if something gets blocked or something goes awry, that that safety valve will pop and it'll release the pressure in the engine and bring it down to a safe level before the engine blows and explodes, right? The First Amendment serves as a safety valve function in the social contract. How so? You watch people, demonstrations, right? People getting up off their couches, getting out to the town squares, getting into the, to the streets and picketing and marching and, and having speeches and waving flags and yelling their heads off. Good, solid protest. And very importantly in this, I am talking about peaceful protests, peaceful protests that abide by the law. What this provides is a safety valve, right? And we're talking about freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, the right to petition government for a redress of grievances. They're all in there. You're getting up off the couch and you're yelling. And that provides a safety valve. Consider the opposite. You can't speak. You can't express yourself. Keep your opinions to yourself. Nobody wants to hear them. Sit down and shut up. Imagine how that would feel. Now, in our culture, that's almost anathema. We can't, even, we can't even think of it. But in some cultures, it is. You will be jailed. 
right? you will be thrown into prison for speaking. This provides the opportunity to let the steam out. Because most times people who go out there and protest feel that they've been heard, feel that they've at least participated, right? And so it lets the social contract continue through its normal processes, through the constitutional mechanisms. Isn't it really a truth-seeking function, freedom of speech, freedom of the press? As we look at who we are as a society, looking at our social contract, we continue to grow and evolve. Medical marijuana, euthanasia, all these social issues that we have today that didn't even exist as social issues, you know, what, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. And yet, the Constitution, this process of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, allows us to communicate and to educate ourselves and to share ideas. Aren't we, in fact, seeking the truth? of who we are as a society, what we feel about these issues, through campaigns and through rhetoric and through debates on Capitol Hill, we're determining who we are as a nation, what we feel is, right? And our feelings change, they grow, evolve, right? Look at the, the debate on mar marijuana. You know, first we went, you know, as Cassidy was talking last week, from medical marijuana to just recreational marijuana at the state level, surely. But we're addressing this idea of marijuana, Right? and what it is in our society and how we want to use it. We are talking amongst ourselves and we're changing the laws accordingly, right? So we're performing a, a truth-seeking adventure through pluralism and through debate. Remember Plato, the allegory of the cave? Somebody came in and freed you. Somebody came in and broke your chains, right? And they led you out of that dark cave and they showed you reality. They showed you the birds and the air and the streams, right? And the sunshine. And I said that night, when I explained that philosophy, that you have an obligation to return the favor. You have an obligation to go back to the people who you consider to be still chained and break their chains as somebody did for you. It's a social obligation. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, assembly, Choosing to adhere to a religion or not really adhere to a religion is part of your social obligation. By participating in civil society, you are educating me. You are helping me discern the truth. You are helping me learn. So again, the First Amendment has social contract benefits. Not surprisingly, because the Constitution is the social contract. Again, educational function, safety valve, truth, and social obligation. If I were writing a seminar question on this, and I were looking at the Constitution and its structures and procedures, looking at civil liberties specifically, I think this would be an important element that I would probably want to sew in somehow, at least a nod to the social contract theories inherent in civil liberties. So let's go ahead and start looking at the First Amendment. The First Amendment includes two statements about religion, commonly referred to as the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. If we remember, it says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, and that is the Establishment Clause, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That is the Free Exercise Clause. It almost sounds redundant, but they're very different things. The Establishment Clause means that government cannot set up a church or pass laws that aid one religion, aid all religion, or favor one religion over another, regardless of what religion happens to be dominant at the time. You notice in the background of this slide, there's a brick wall. And this, come, this brings in the idea of the wall of separation between church and state. Now, you may have heard this term, right? You may have looked for it in the Constitution. It's not in the Constitution. It's an idea, it's an analogy, a metaphor that Thomas Jefferson actually when responding to an invitation to him as president to attend a church service. So here's the story. Thomas Jefferson is a deist. Thomas Jefferson considers himself uh, a very, uh, very age of enlightenment guy along the lines of Voltaire. He's suspicious of religion personally, and he considers himself a deist. A deist is somebody who believes that God exists, God set the world, the universe into motion, and then backed away. He's the great clockmaker. He stepped back and let, let the thing go. That's roughly what a deist believed. That's what Jefferson believed. And so it's interesting then that you have this nomination of ministers who are asking Jefferson to come to church, not as Thomas Jefferson, but as president of the United States. Oh, what a sticky wicket, right? How is he going to respond? Well, this is his letter. 
believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, and that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with solemn reverence that act of the whole American people, the Constitution, which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. If you're talking about the First Amendment, it says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. This doesn't deal with the president. It doesn't say that the president can't do X, Y, or Z. All legislative powers in the Constitution are given to Congress. So if you're going to make a law that's going to be in Congress, it says nothing about the president. It's silent. So what Jefferson is doing is he's interpreting founders' intent. And he's saying, the genius of the American people said that we were going to separate, a wall of separation between church and state. And so he, he's basing his declination on this First Amendment precept, this First Amendment philosophy. Looking at the Establishment Clause specifically, what might be some issues? Well, school voucher initiatives, religious symbols on federal land, teaching evolution versus intelligent design, what about school-sponsored prayer or inviting religious instructors into public schools to give optional religious instruction? Your book touches on many of these. I know that your book has a wonderful little cartoon, right, in Chapter 4 about school vouchers. It talks about religious symbols on federal lands. It talks about teaching intelligent design. And so these all come under the Establishment Clause because, in effect, what it would mean is that Congress would be establishing a religion or benefiting a religion or religion in the Constitution is prohibited. So school voucher initiatives, now this is kind of dated. Does anybody, does this sound familiar, school voucher initiatives? Anybody remember this? Uh, I don't. Okay, no. This is rough. This is my generation. Okay, fair enough. So here's the deal. Little Janie and little Johnny, right? They're, let's say they're in fourth grade. And their parents want to send them to school. Now, let's pick, you guys pick a religion. Any religion. Huh? Judaism. Judaism. Okay. And so little, little Johnny is going to go off to public school. But little Jane's parents want her to go uh, to Hebrew school, right, to be indoctrinated in the traditions of Judaism. And so they apply. Actually, they sue based on the 14th Amendment, equal protection, that if little Johnny gets to go to school for free, then the benefit would be for little Jane's parents to be reimbursed for the tuition they're out of because they're relieving the state of educating little Janie, and so they should be reimbursed for their out-of-pocket expenses. Here's the question then. What you're looking at is free exercise of religion. The parents have every right to send their kid to Hebrew school. Off she go. Do we, though, the taxpayers have an obligation to pay for that child's religious indoctrination because that's what a religious school does. That's the intent of a religious school is to indoctrinate kids into that religion, into that indoctrination. We're not talking about charter schools or private schools. We're talking about religious schools like Hebrew school, Catholic school. And so the courts came down and said, although you do make a point about equal protection, we have a preferred freedom, which is the First Amendment, which is the Establishment Clause that Congress shall make no law establishing a religion. And by sending little Janie off to Hebrew school, they are in effect, if they were to pay for it, they were in effect establishing a religion by paying for the indoctrination of a child into a religious discipline. You get the idea, okay? Good. Okay, so then what about religious symbols on public land? The Supreme Court came down in the same summer session and found two very different findings in two different cases within days of each other. One dealt with a 5,300-pound monument, a marble monument, granite monument, right, on a courthouse lawn. And the other case dealt with a lithograph, a framed print of the Ten Commandments. The 5,300-pound monument they found was constitutional. The lithograph was unconstitutional. The 5,300-pound monument was one of a series of monuments that showed the evolution of law. So it wasn't just the Ten Commandments. There was also... Um, Hammurabi's Code. There was also the Napoleonic Code. There were other examples of law, the evolution of law throughout history. So it wasn't saying that the Ten Commandments is the only, the preferred system, that it's one of a, an evolution. Lithograph came with a cover memo, cover letter, that said, 
we think the Ten Commandments is, uh, is preeminent and should be displayed in your courthouse because it is the Judeo-Christian tradition should have prevalence in our society, and you need to hang this, this lithograph to make that point. Unconstitutional. Why? The intent. The intent of the monument was to show the evolution of law. The intent of the lithograph was to say that the Judeo-Christian tradition is premier and should be recognized as such, which led the backers of the lithograph to comment after the court case was found that had their memo said this is to show the evolution of law, then that lithograph would have been constitutional. That's all it took. The answer is yes, because it was about the intention. The intention was to show the preeminence of Judeo-Christianity at the expense of other religions, which in effect is establishing a religion. And so we're talking about a state courthouse, which brings in the 14th Amendment, that those things that are given to the central government are now applied to the state. So a state courthouse under the purview of the state is held to the same parameters that the central government is. Little Janie and Little Johnny, right? Off they go to school. Well, how do we get them there? Everson v. New Jersey, 1974, the court held that bus fare reimbursements to the parents of both private and public school students wasn't a matter of religion, but of public safety. So little Johnny's going, to, little Janie is going to school. How we get her from her parents' door to the school isn't a matter of religion. That religious indoctrination isn't happening on the bus. That's a matter of public safety. So little Janie's parents sue and say, well, if little Johnny's parents get reimbursed for their bus fare, then little Janie should too. Court found you right. Because it's not a matter of religion. It's a matter of safety. You following me? Except this created what's known as the slippery slope. It invoked the idea of incrementalism. Incrementalism, or an increment, is small steps toward an end destination. For example, you're walking, you're hiking, recently rained, and you take one step off the trail, and next thing you know, you're at the bottom of the hill, right? You've been there before, because you just slide that first step. Once you take that first step, all the next steps are that much easier. Once you start going in a direction, it's hard to change that direction. So this is known as the slippery slope. If you're looking at Everson, and you're looking at it as the first step, then what are some other programs, do you think, that might be nibbling around the edges of public-private schools? Well, what about school lunch programs? What about driver's education, right? Neither of these are religious purpose. Right? They're matters of public safety or public good. It kind of opened the gates. Once Everson passed, it was like, okay, schools started suing for all these remunerations for these programs that they had been offering. So they had to come up with a system that allowed the judges an opportunity to, to review each case individually. But when it comes to religion, you can never be correct. You're always going to off. Somebody's always going to get mad when you talk about religion. And so this is to say that judges, who are human beings, are also going to have religious sentiment of some form or another. And so you want to allow the judges the opportunity to step back from their own sentiment. You want to give them some kind of a, a mechanism, some kind of a lever that they can push that's dispassionate and remove them from their own religious sentiment. Check. This is lemon. Or... The Lemon Test. It's actually Lemon v. Kurtzman, 1971. So if I've done my job right, you'll note that 1971 predates 1974. So Lemon v. Kurtzman already existed. It was Everson that forced the court to pull it back, to pull it out of the annals, and begin to use it as a test for slippery slope. So here it is. You are three levers that the judge gets to push. Looking at each individual case coming down the pike, does the program have a secular purpose? Can it be used to advance or inhibit a religion? Thirdly, and this is where the judge does have a little discrimination, should avoid excessive government entanglement between religion and government. So there's two phrases in here, excessive and entanglement, that allow the judge an opportunity to, right, to discern or to look at the subtleties. What is entanglement? What is excessive? Ah. So... Let's take a look at our two test cases, driver's training and school lunch programs. So you're a judge, and you have three levers to press. Does driver's training have 
a secular purpose. Secular being non-religious or for the good of society. Yes, obviously, you want these little darlings schooled in how to drive, yes? And so the more training we can give them, the better before they get out on the roads. And you guys are you guys are nodding, so I see that you're agreeing. It can't be used to advance or inhibit religion. Driver's training doesn't advance religion. It's about knowing to turn your turn indicator on and go to the speed limit and how to drive. Excessive government entanglement. So this is where the discernment comes in. Right? So let's say that in a public school, the school district contracts out to a private company, a driver's education company, to come onto the campus, right, to come onto the high school campus, and as an after-school program available to students, have it easy so that the students have it easy and they'll take advantage of it, maybe at a cut rate, right? At a Catholic school or Hebrew school, then, what you're looking for is excessive government entanglement. If the government pays for that driver's education company to come to this Hebrew school and make the same program available to those kids as it does to the public school kids, is it excessive entanglement? There's going to be entanglement. There's going to be contracts. There's going to be insurance. There's going to be lots of issues. But the, the good of the program, the secular purpose of the program, in relation to the, in the entanglement, isn't excessive. The public good, the well-trained drivers, is worth the government's hassle. Not so fast. School lunch programs. So little Johnny and little Janie both qualify for school lunch programs. But the Hebrew school is very small. It only has 50 students. They don't have the facilities for a hot lunch program. But the incorporate, incorporation doctrine means that it has to be applied to the states. right? So you have to be fairness. You have to have equal protection. So does it have a secular purpose? School lunch? A hamburger is a hamburger. A hungry kid is a hungry kid. It's not about religion. Excessive government entanglement. So this means, and this is a real court case, there wasn't a Hebrew school, that if the school is so small, does the government have a responsibility then, under the equal protection idea, philosophy, to build the facilities on that small school campus so that little Janie can have her hot lunch? The courts found, looking at the value of the program, that it was entanglement. It's sure entanglement because the government's going to have to build the facilities. It's going to have to staff the facilities. It's going to have to run the facilities. It is entanglement. Is it excessive? When you balance the problems inherent in a, against a hungry child, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> and so then the next we come to is the free exercise clause. The free exercise clause of the First Amendment provides that Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. So it protects the right of the individuals to worship or believe as they wish or to hold no religious belief. And so some examples would include saluting the flag, the Pledge of Allegiance, withholding unemployment benefits from a person who refuses to work on the Sabbath, the religious use of peyote, in Native American visioning quests. So most people don't realize what impact Jehovah's Witnesses have had on civil liberties in the United States. On the eve of World War II, two young Jehovah's Witnesses refused to salute the flag in their Pennsylvania classroom. Across America, thousands of Witness kids took the same stand and were kicked out of school. The Witnesses sued the government. Eight to one, the Supreme Court ruled against the Witnesses. It said the government could force its citizens to make a patriotic salute. Jehovah's Witnesses continued their refusal. Editorials in 200 newspapers condemned the ruling, noting the irony. Isn't this what America was supposed to be fighting against in Nazi Germany? They argued that a free country shouldn't force people to pledge allegiance to anything. In an unprecedented move, the Supreme Court agreed and reversed itself in just three years. Jehovah's Witnesses have been at the U.S. Supreme Court more than any other group other than the U.S. government. And the cases have reverberated throughout the entire First Amendment, freedom of press, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, assembly. Jehovah's Witnesses were talking about a different solution, and sometimes aggressively so, because they felt very strongly that the ultimate solution doesn't come from war, but rather from God's kingdom. 
combine that with the nationalism that was sweeping the country in the face of, of uh, growing international difficulty. And there was quite the unwillingness, the intolerance to hear the message that the witnesses wanted to articulate. Witnesses were scorned as unpatriotic. They wouldn't pledge loyalty to any man-made symbols, calling into question what it means to be an American. Between 1935 and 1958, the Jehovah's Witnesses were in the Supreme Court a remarkable 45 times. Uh, and there are periods during uh, First Amendment history when you see a particular group really carrying the banner of free expression. You could say that they don't fight, you could say that they don't vote, but what they have done is litigate. And in a way, they've contributed more uh, to American democracy and the protection of American ideals than a lot of people have with their votes. The right to speak freely on street corners and door to door. To publish an unconventional message without getting arrested. The right to be a conscientious objector of war. And the right of all patients seeking medical treatment to control what's done to their bodies. You can connect the dots and show how Jehovah's Witnesses have actually helped groups even groups they disagree with. And what's, what's really interesting is that Jehovah's Witnesses are not progressive. They're mor moral social conservatives. They aren't activists. They're only going to the court to, for their own purposes to, so they can preach and, and, and worship the way they want. Yet, when they win a right, that right extends to everybody across the board. What they're talking about in these two cases is the 1940 Gobitis case and the three years later case is the West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett. And so in their reversing themselves, what they're finding is saluting the flag in and of itself is a form of utterance. It's a freedom of speech issue, right? So it's not just a freedom of religion exercise. It is also freedom of speech. And so they furthered their finding when they said that no public official, no president, no congressperson, no governor, no school principal, could prescribe what is orthodox, what is right, what is correct in politics, nationalism, religion, or any other matter of opinion. And so this goes back to what Thomas Jefferson said in his letter, that government reaches only to actions, that it doesn't reach into your opinions, it doesn't reach into your heart, into your mind. That's an interesting case to hold, and again, this is freedom of exercise. The next one that we have is Sherbert versus Werner. And so the idea when you get unemployment is that you get a job as soon as you can. If you were offered a job and you turn it down, the idea that you will be denied your unemployment rights, your unemployment benefits, because you were offered a job and you turned it down. Unless, what happens if that job was on your Sabbath? So the free exercise means that if you have a Sabbath and it, it is beholden on you to observe that Sabbath, that we can't use a government program to punish you for your exercising your religion. Peyote, a hallucinogenic, naturally occurring in a cactus plant. The three states and the federal government provide exception, exceptions for the religious use of peyote by Native Americans envisioning quests. And this is important to say that the Native American church doctrine forbid the non-religious use of peyote. So this is for visioning quests. This is a serious spiritual exercise, and it's not meant to be recreational by nature. So that's where the exemption comes in, because we're talking about the free exercise of their religion. School prayer. So the lemon test applies except in extracurricular activities and student-led prayers. So there's inconsistencies in the court findings, not surprisingly, because every court case has its own elements, just like the 5,300-pound monument in the frame lithograph. I have a list here of Supreme Court cases, uh, it's at least 50, 60 in here, um, and each one has very specific elements to it. For example, prayers from the podium at graduation exercises is okay. A student-led prayer in a huddle before a football game, not okay. Prayers over a PA system prior to a game, not okay. Students meeting at the flagpole before class to pray is okay. Students holding a Bible study in a room after school is okay. I like to focus on this last one because it's fairly recent. It was 1990, the Merges case, and this is Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, a retired Supreme Court justice, you may have heard her name, who in writing for the majority found that there was a distinction between government speech endorsing a religion, which the Establishment Clause forbids, which is what the school was saying that you can't meet in this classroom after class is over, because that would be, by giving you permission to meet, to study the Bible, that would be tantamount to the school establishing a religion or helping endorse a religion. 
So the school determined just to not allow them to meet, and so they sued. The argument is that it's not just about the Establishment Clause. It's the Free Exercise Clause, because what they're coming together to do is none of the state's business. Unless you're doing it for safety issues, you have the debate club, you have the drama club, you have the chess club, you have the sewing club, whatever. If you don't deny them, you can't deny the Bible study group just because they're studying the Bible. Because it also goes to freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. What you're doing is you're stopping people from coming together assembling because of what they're doing. And what they're doing in this case is studying the Bible. Again, it's not a public order issue. It's not public safety. Right? It was a fear of establishing a religion. So freedom of speech, free exercise, and freedom of assembly, three preferred freedoms come in balance to the fear of the establishment clause, and this wins. In their attempts to draw a line separating permissible from impermissible speech, judges have to balance freedom of expression against competing values such as public order, national security, and the right to a fair trial. So this is when, you know, for example, you have a gag order where freedom of speech and freedom of the press is limited in order for the person to make sure that they were given a fair trial. Or I'm thinking of WikiLeaks, right? I'm thinking of any uh, leaking of confidential material or classified material and how that relates to national security. And if somebody can be charged and, and convicted for criminal um, activity, because what we're talking about is freedom of speech. The counterbalance is, this is my freedom of speech. So before we go there, let me, let me kind of define that there are times when the government can tell you to sit down and shut up. Freedom of speech isn't meant to be universal. In fact, we're going to find the founding generation had high-value speech and low-value speech. High-value speech is the idea of being able to openly criticize government without fear of retribution. Why? This is what happened during the intolerable acts, if you remember, right? People crying against the King of England and the intolerable acts that were coming down. People were picked up off the streets and thrown into jail, right? They were punished for what they were saying. So this First Amendment right is a direct link to the founders' experience with the colonial times. Okay, so there has to be, though, that high-value speech to criticize government and then elements of being able to say, no, 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 we don't have universal freedom of speech. That's a misnomer. You can ha be made to sit down and shut up. One is the clear and present danger test. Now, your book talks about these, and man, they're confusing. So let me try to ferret it out a little bit. There are two examples of the clear and present danger test. One is a pamphlet, right? A little folded pamphlet that we were handed out, and one is a speech. So it's both written and spoken, clear and present danger test. The definition that Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Supreme Court Justice, came down with is that the question in every case is whether the words are used in such circumstances are of such nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent. Okay, a couple of key elements here. Congress has a right to prevent. Where would Congress's rights be found? In the Constitution. So those enumerated powers that, we, that I yammered on about in Article 1, Section 8, those are the powers given to Congress specifically. They're enumerated. They're listed out. And so those are congressional rights. Those are the rights of Congress. Substantive evils, real evils, not just, gee, you know, we think that there might be some repercussions to this. There may be some problems, like the Pentagon Papers, right? The Pentagon Papers were uh, papers that were going to be published by the uh, New York Times. Embarrassed the nation. They had to do with um, getting into Vietnam. And it was going to embarrass the nation incredibly. It was New York Times. And the court found that, you know, it's going to embarrass us, and there's going to be damage, but... We can't show that there's going to be actual substantive damage. So this pamphlet handed out to 1,500 young men of draft age during World War I, an unpopular war in the beginning, when Congress was tasked with raising and supporting an army, one of those enumerated powers, right? And so a uh, resulting power is that they have the right to issue a draft that men enlist at this point, right? That adult men enlist to institute a draft. We, you know the term draft, right? And so these 1,500 pamphlets said, assert your rights, do not submit to intimidation. The intimidation that we're referring to is the draft. 
Don't submit to intimidation. Don't submit to the, the idea that if you don't call, answer the call to the draft that you'll be thrown in jail. Don't submit. Right? And so it's a challenge. It's calling up the young men of draft age to resist the draft. This is a substantive evil that Congress has a right to prevent. The right based in the ability to raise and support an army and subsequent draft. And so Schenck was jailed. The court upheld his conviction. The next one is Debs, Eugene Debs, who was involved in a speech called Socialism is the Answer. So Eugene Debs actually ran for president of the United States from the Socialist Party from jail, which is kind of brilliant. So in 1918, in a speech given to 1,200 people in Ohio, Debs was prosecuted for remarks such as, I may not be able to think, say all that I think, but you need to know that you are fit for something better than slavery and common fodder. And so common fodder, this is like cannon fodder, or stuff that cannon will rip into. That's the fodder, right? And so you're fit for something better than something for a cannonball to hit. And so what he's doing is he's, in a speech, arguing against young men of draft age participating in the draft. Debs was told to sit down and shut up. He was thrown into prison for it. So this is the clear and present danger. Yeah, Cassidy. Well, I was going to say the times back then, too. Ooh, okay, so I was going to bring this up. So this <laughs> is when Alice Paul and the suffragettes are also at their peak. You may remember, actually, we'll be looking at it next week, when they chain themselves, they, the suffragettes, chain themselves to the White House fence in order to gain attention to the, the stalling of women's right to vote, right, gaining the franchise. And they were arrested for... As, uh, as political prisoners, they're arrested for political reasons and thrown into jail because their activities, their chaining themselves to the White House fence, was seen as a distraction for the president. The president should be affecting the war. He needn't be worried about women right now. Hold your tongue until the war is over, is what they were saying to him, right? Alice Paul and the suffragettes said, no, 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 this is exactly what we're fighting for. And so they were arrested for their political speech. They're chaining themselves. This is the era, as Cassidy suggests. You know, it was a very fraught time. It was an unpopular war in the beginning. It was hard enough to get an army up. We were unprepared for it. We were being drunk into it. Woodrow Wilson, the president at the time, ran on the idea that he would keep us out of war, and he wasn't able to. Oh, my gosh, right? So you're absolutely right. At the time... This is also, you know, a really good indication of the popular culture at the time and discovering who we are through these processes, through these court conversations. The bad tendency test. So the next, bad, next one is, when can the government tell you to sit down and shut up if you're just creating mischief, if you're meant to be creating mischief, like yelling fire in a crowded theater? That would be speech with a bad tendency, and you can't be jailed for that. That's not what they intended, right? Freedom of speech wasn't intended. What about action? Symbolic speech. So not just words, right? Not just writing, not just giving a speech. What about contributing to a political campaign? Right? So I have a dollar in my pocket, and I want to give it to somebody who's running for office. My giving them that dollar to use their for, their, for their campaign is symbolic speech. My giving them that money is a symbol, and it's protected. It's protected as speech. What the courts have had to find, and we'll talk about campaign finance in, in Chapter 9, when I have $10 million, am I going to actually be buying undue influence? Am I just participating, or am I buying influence? And that's the protection. So the freedom of speech is going to be balanced against the public good of having a fair, open election, and not some private Joe who has $10 bucks buying himself or herself. A politician. What about burning the flag? Or taking the knee during the national anthem at a football game. This is symbolic speech. And we've had any number of constitutional amendments proposed that have never passed. Dozens and dozens, trust me, of constitutional amendments proposed to prohibit burning the flag. It's abhorrent. Have you ever seen an American flag? Have you ever watched one in person? It's very dramatic, right? So we see it on TV a lot. There's a picture in your book. But seeing it in person is very dramatic. This is symbolic speech. And it's protected. What I, would argue, what I would argue, though, is freedom of speech includes the right to hear what's being said. So here's how. I bring you back to Westboro Baptist Church, what we opened with. And if we think about their freedom of speech, okay, we know they're contributing to the public discourse. We know that it's distasteful. We know that it's, it's fraught. People are, rise up in anger. Oh, wait a minute. People rise up in anger. They rise up in response to 
what the Westboro Baptist Church was saying. Have you ever heard about the Laramie Project? Oh, good. Okay, so the Laramie Project involved the Westboro Baptist Church, who was picketing Matthew Shepard's funeral. You may remember Matthew Shepard, who was a young man who was, who was killed because of his sexuality. And the Westboro Baptist Church came to picket, not surprisingly, his funeral with their signs. And you know, I, I hope you know the ones I'm talking about. These are the ones that God hates fags and America is doomed, it's damned. And, and I mean, that's what it says. I'm not just, right. It, they're dreadful, dreadful. And so what happened is the folks of Laramie came together and to protect the family from this church picketing, came up with an idea of dressing up as angels with really, really big wings, like really big wings, and that they would come and they would stand between the protesters and the family at the funeral. So instead of seeing these signs, they would see a line of beautifully dressed people, angels. Right? And so this meant that the people of Laramie were getting up and getting off their couches and contributing to the conversation as antithesis to the Westboro Baptist Church. You get it? And so the right to hear what's being said, even if it really means that it's good because it means that it's contributing to the conversation. We know who we are because of who we are not. And we're not going to know who we, are, who we are not until we're presented in our face. I am not that. That is not me, and here's how. You get the idea? Freedom of the press, the fourth estate, and prior restraint. And so prior restraint refers to government's censorship of material in the press before it's published. Prior to the restraint being exercised, the government must demonstrate a compelling reason for the censorship before any restraint is imposed. So I had alluded to the Pentagon Papers case before 1971, where the Supreme Court ruled against this idea of prior restraint, prohibiting the publication of, uh, in this case, the Pentagon Papers, where the Nixon administration was unable to obtain an injunction against the New York Times that would have prohibited this publication of secret documents pertaining to the American involvement in the Vietnam War. And so it was going to embarrass the nation. It was going to embarrass the administration. And the court held that that wasn't sufficient um, weight to compel the censorship. A con on the other side is a uh, high school newspaper. High school newspaper isn't considered a public forum. And it can be regulated in a reasonable manner by high school officials. Assembly. So this is another issue, right? The right to assemble actually has two elements. The right to assemble, but also the right to associate. So freedom of assembly, the right to assemble within reasonable limits that are called time, place, and manner restrictions. A freedom of assembly includes the right to parade, to picket, and to protest. While many cities require permits to use public grounds to have a parade, they may not use their licensing power to, for, to suppress freedom of speech. So here's how. Your book talks about this, the KKK, wanting to march in Chicago, right? And that Chicago denied them their permit. So they, they went up to another, to a, a city up the coast and a small town with a large black population and said that they were going to march there instead because they wouldn't deny them their permit. And so Chicago backed down. The idea was that you can't use your permitting authority to stop somebody from marching just because you find what they're saying distasteful. There are time, place, and manner restrictions. So now we're dealing with the idea of public safety. And so if you're the KKK and you're marching down a predominantly black neighborhood, I, or my neighborhood, you're going you're gonna to find that you're going to need protection, right? Because you're going to find people coming out to protest your protests to respond to your protests. Potential for physical violence is going to be heightened. And as we've seen in the recent past, the women's marches following the inauguration of President Trump were one example of a strong assembly, whereas Black Lives Matter, while also a strong assembly, did have elements of violence and the insurrection of persons storming the United States Capitol on the day of the certification of Electoral College results in the 2020 election were an example of riotous behavior and thus is not covered in freedom of assembly, obviously. And so you can't say the KKK can't, K can't march. What you can say is, and the KKK, because you're marching, you're going to need special protection. You're going to need the police out there in droves. 
and the taxpayers aren't going to foot the bill. You're going to foot the bill. And so you can march, but you have to remunerate the city for all the security that you're going to need. If you do this, you have to make sure that you apply that standard to everybody who applies. And so the next Sunday, the Girl Scouts want to have a march. And you say the same thing to them. You say, you're going to need protection. And you have to pay for your protection. Now, the Girl Scouts are not going to need as much protection as the KKK. And so the time, place, and manner restriction is being applied fairly. But you can see that there's a significant difference. Another good one is when you look at parades, parades in city limits are considered assembly. Now, they're celebratory, but there's also a lot of potential. There's potential for booze. There's potential for fights. You know, people don't behave well. And so you're going to need that extra security. Even though it's a celebration, not the KKK, you're going to need that extra security. The same holds true. You're going to have to pay for your extra security. So whether it's a parade or an assembly, the idea of place, manner, restrictions allow for public safety while allowing the freedom of speech. This includes the right to associate. If you have the right to come together in the Constitution, that coming together is assembly. It's also association. Your coming together means that you are associating, you're communicating, you're having a meeting with these other people, you're having a speech, you're listening to Martin Luther King right on the mall, you are associating. That association then is a guarantee in the Constitution by virtue of the right to assembly. So I have um, the NAACP in 1958 who sued the state of Alabama who wanted their membership rolls. Yeah. 1958. The state of Alabama wants the NAACP's membership rolls. Not a good combination. And so they sued, and they won. Because the right to associate is considered private. Your association is private. And the state can't compel a private organization, in this instance, to come, to, to come out and give them their membership rolls. Well, it is beyond debate that freedom to engage in association for the advancement of beliefs and ideas is an inseparable aspect of the liberty assured by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, which embraces freedom of speech. Of course, it's immaterial whether the beliefs sought to be advanced by association pertain to political, economic, religious, or cultural matters, and state action, which may have the effect of curtailing the freedom to associate, is subject to the closest scrutiny. It would appear from the Supreme Court's opinions that the right of association is derivative from the First Amendment guarantees of speech, assembly, and petition, although it has at times seemingly been referred to as a separate, independent freedom protected by the First Amendment. The doctrine is a fairly consistent construction, the problems associated with it having previously arisen primarily in the context of loyalty, security investigations of the Communist Party and individual memberships therein, and in other organizations, and these having been resolved without giving rise to any separate theory of association. So, freedom of association as a concept thus grew out of a series of cases in the 1950s and the 1960s, as I suggest, in which states were attempting to curb the activities of the NAACP. In the first case, the court unanimously set aside a contempt citation imposed after the organization refused to comply with the court order to produce a list of its members within the state. Effective advocacy of both public and private points of view, particularly controversial ones, is undeniably enhanced by group association. And this court, suggests the Supreme Court, has more than once recognized by remarking upon the case nexus between the freedoms of speech and of assembly. These indispensable liberties, whether of speech, press, or association, may be abridged by governmental action either directly or indirectly, and the state has failed to demonstrate a need for the lists which would outweigh the harm to the association's rights which disclosure would produce. The next speaks to the right to petition Congress for a redress of grievances. Well, the right of petition took its rise from the modest provision made for it in Chapter 61 of Magna Carta. To this meager beginning, Parliament itself and its procedures in the enactment of legislation 
the equity jurisdiction of the Lord Chancellor and proceedings against the Crown by petition of right were all in some measure traceable. Thus, while the King summoned Parliament for the purpose of supply, the latter, but especially the House of Commons, petitioned the King for a redress of grievances as its price for meeting the financial needs of the monarch, and as an increased in importance, it came to claim the right to dictate the form of the king's reply until, in 1414, commons declared itself to be as well as centers as petitioners. 250 years later, in 1669, commons further resolved that every commoner in England possessed the inherent right to prepare and present petitions to it in cases of grievances and of commons to receive the same, and to judge whether they were fit to be received. Historically, therefore, the right of petition is the primary right, the right peaceably to assemble, a subordinate and instrumental right, as if the First Amendment read, the right of the people peaceably to assemble in order to petition the government. Today, however, the right of peaceable assembly is, in the language of the court, cognate to that of free speech and free press, and is equally fundamental. It is one that cannot be denied without violating those fundamental principles of liberty and justice which lie at the base of all civil and political institutions, principles which the 14th Amendment embodies in the general terms of its due process clause. The holdings of meetings for peaceable political action cannot be proscribed. Those who assist in the, conduct of, in the conduct of such meetings cannot be branded as criminals on that score. The question is not as to the auspices under which the meeting is held, but as to its purposes. Not as to the relation of the speakers, but whether, whether their utterances transcend the bonds of freedom of speech which the Constitution protects. Furthermore, the right of petition has expanded. It is no longer confined to demands for a redress of grievances, in any accurate meaning of these words, but com comprehends demands for an exercise by the government of its powers in the furtherance of the interest and propriety of the petitioners and of their views on politically contentious matters. The right extends to the approach of citizens or groups, of them to administrative agencies, which are both the creatures of the legislature and arms of the executive, and to courts, the third branch of government. Certainly, then, the right to petition extends to all departments of the government. The right of access to the courts is indeed but one aspect of the right of petition. The Second Amendment reads, a well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. So why the heck am I saying comma? Remember the semicolon, right? Right, it's all one, it's all one thought. But what you hear of the Second Amendment is the right of the people to, people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. What you fail to hear on a, on a very regular basis is the, the preceding part, which is a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. So the idea of a, an armed populace is connected in the Founding Fathers' minds to the idea of a well-regulated militia. So you remember, quartering of soldiers, when we talked about this in the Declaration of Independence lecture, the quartering of soldiers was to send people, soldiers home with you to keep tabs on you. You would house them, you would feed them, you would give them rum and clothe them and provide them fire and basically house them as an occupying army, as an occupying force. This made perfect sense at the time. We said that those intolerable acts would eventually find their way into the Constitution. So in the anti-federalist's mind, this is one way that government can really invade your life. The quartering of soldiers was a very powerful, very effective tool under Lord North, under King George, a Revolutionary War era. So what we have then is this constitutional proscription against the quartering of soldiers, dot, dot, dot. But what we're really looking at here is the right to privacy. 
Now, how many people in here believe that there's a right to privacy evident in the Constitution? The right to privacy is inherent in the Bill of Rights, and this is the cornerstone, that your home is your castle. That's what's in evidence here. And so you can't impose the courting of soldiers. An unwarranted search and seizure is going to yeah. be next, right? And so although the need for the Third Amendment um, quartering the soldiers perhaps has passed, the idea of the right to privacy hasn't. So the remaining rights that we're going to be talking about are, for the most part, the rights of people accused of crimes. Now, in the founding generation's mind, again, the anti-federalists, this is how government can impose its will, by picking you up and throwing you in jail, primarily for political reasons. Few provisions of the Bill of Rights grew so directly out of the experience of the colonials as the Fourth Amendment did, embodying, as it did, the protection against the utilization of what are called writs of assistance, and I'll touch on that in a second. But while the insistence on freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures as a fundamental right gained expression in the colonies late, and as a result of experience, there was a rich English experience to draw on. Every man's house is his castle. Well, this was the maxim much celebrated in England, as was demonstrated in a court case called Semaine's case, decided in 1603. In this, which was a civil case of execution of process, the case nonetheless, in its language, recognized the right of the homeowner to defend his house against unlawful entry, even by the king's agents, but contrarily as well recognized the authority of the appropriate officers to break and enter upon notice in order to arrest or execute the king's will. Well, most famous of the English cases was called Entick versus Carrington, uh, one of the series of civil actions against state officials who had, pursuant to general warrants, raided many homes and other places in search of materials connected with John Wilkes polemical pamphlets, attacking not only government policies, but, gasp, the king himself. In the colonies, smuggling, rather than seditious libel, afforded leading examples of the necessity for protection against unreasonable search and seizure. In order to enforce the revenue laws, English authorities made use of what are called writs of assistance, which were generally warrants authorizing the bearer to enter any house or any other place to search for and seize prohibited and unaccustomed goods, and commanded all subjects to assist in these endeavors. The writs, once issued, remained in force throughout the lifetime of the sovereign, of the king or queen, and even after six months after their death. When, upon the death of George II, who we talked about in 1760, the authorities were required to obtain the issuance of new writs, right? Opposition to this was led by James Otis, who attacked such writs on libertarian grounds and who asserted the invalidity of the authorizing statutes because they conflicted with English constitutionalism. Well, Otis lost, <laughs> and the writs were issued and utilized, but his arguments were much cited in the colonies, not only on the immediate subject, but also with regard to our Bill of Rights. So the original Bill of Rights was intended to protect criminal defendants against political repercussions, or repercussions because of your political leanings, your uh, political allegiances. But it's been expanded to be a concern uh, for the rights of people accused of crime generally. And so they were originally to protect the accused in political arrests, but today the protections of the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and Eighth Amendments are primarily applied in criminal court cases. What we're talking about in these amendments is the due process of law. So due process is one of those terms that perhaps rings a little oddly to our ears. Perhaps another way to phrase it would be the process of law, the process that you have coming to you, the process that is applied fairly. By virtue of being a citizen, you have rights of due process, rights of the way that government law will protect you. For example, remember my distinction between our being a democracy and a republic? And I said that in a democracy, the posse was coming after me and they were going to string me up for being a horse thief. And I said, then the difference in a republic is we live by the rule of law. 
and a sheriff comes in and says, wait, before you hang him, you have to try him. You have to prove that he's guilty, right? And then the penalty for breaking that law is expressed in the law. We live by the rule of law. This is the due process that we're talking about. That is what that horse thief is going to be experiencing, their due process. So the fourth and the fifth and fourteenth amendments provide for due process to help protect individual individuals from the arbitrary power of the state. But due process can be further divided into two elements or two aspects: substantive due process and procedural due process. So Substantive due process is the principles that the laws and the penalties for breaking the laws must be reasonable. That the substance of the laws go through the due process of a Republican form of government, which is a legislative body. A legislative body accountable to the people. So, you're walking down the street and you throw your gum on the, on the, in the gutter, right? You're, you broke the law. And they're going to come by and they're going to arrest you and they're going to throw you in jail for 50 years, right? With no, right? With no um, chance of parole. The question is, is the penalty for breaking the law reasonable? Obviously not. The penalties for breaking the law must be reasonable. So I give you three strikes. You know the idea of three strikes, right? That your third offense culminates in a greater penalty than it would have originally by virtue of the prior two offenses. In other words, if you get busted twice and then you get busted a third time, that third time's penalty is going to send you to jail for much longer than had it been your first one. Three strikes, right? So the question is, is that substantive due process? Did we come to that three strikes legislation by virtue of this representative form of government? Did the people have an opportunity to chime in? Right? Was it a public discourse, or did was it just imposed? Well, three strikes was very popular in the beginning, and then rose in its unpopularity as people realized the draconian measures of it, and how it would actually look, and how it would play out. And so the courts have begun to limit three strikes by virtue of it being lacking substantive due process, that you're punishing somebody more than you would have normally. You get the idea? So substantive due process. Procedural due process is that the laws must be administered in a fair manner. So no matter who you are, right, that the law is applied to you as it would be to you, to you, to you, to me, right? Well, okay, so we're dealing with really two elements of enforcing the law. The first, the rubber meets the road, is the law enforcement, the police, right? But then also the judges. So first let's start with the police. You're going down Highway 29 speeding like a bat out of hell, and you get pulled over. And the cop is in a good mood. And perhaps you, you're very deferential. Perhaps you, you, you defer to the cop. And you, you admit you know, you're going too fast, and you're sheepish, and you're very submissive. And, and things just line up so that the cop takes pity on you and shakes their finger at you and sends you off with a warning. You are thrilled, and you're certainly not going to complain that you got off with a warning. And then I come along, and perhaps the cop doesn't like me for whatever reason, right? Or I'm not as deferential, or I'm not as submissive. Whatever the cop determines to be the, the key to letting me off. And he slaps me with a ticket, and I have to pay the ticket and go to traffic school and have my insurance rates go up. It's the same law. We both broke the same law. The law must be administered fairly. Now, there are elements of the cops needing to be able to differentiate, to allow for a little discretion, and I'm not arguing with that. I'm arguing for the basic assumption that the laws be applied fairly. So those are the cops. Secondly, the judges. Now, judges are, this is all happening in uh, the court of law, and so they're much more structured. They're much more, ed there's much more need for adherence. So how lenient a judge can be is within the parameters of the law, the parameters of leeway that a judge can give you in a penalty, for perhaps um, spinning your gum on the sidewalk. Right? That there might be between a fine and a jail sentence, and the judge can be as lenient or as hard as they want to be. But for the most part, there is a structure, there is a process that the judge has to determine how long you're going to spend in jail for spinning your gum in the gutter. So justice is meant to be blind. 
So if you're rich or poor, black or white, male or female, young or old, it doesn't matter. The law should be applied fairly. The Fourth Amendment, then, is quite specific in forbidding unreasonable searches and seizures. No court may issue a warrant except upon probable cause. And so this probable cause language is very specific, and I'm going to give you examples of it, to believe that a crime has occurred or is about to occur. And then warrants must specify the area to be searched. Now, I'm not claiming to be a civil rights or civil liberties attorney, and I don't know everything there is to know about searches and seizures, but we're looking at the political science behind the prohibition against searches and seizures. In Berenger v. the United States, Justice Jackson in 1949 said, I quote, among deprivation of rights, none is so effective in cowing a population, crushing the spirit of the individual, and putting terror in the heart, in every heart. Uncontrolled search and seizure is one of the first and most effective weapons in the arsenal of every arbitrary government. One need only briefly to have dwelt and worked among a people possessed of many admirable qualities, but deprived of these rights to know that the human personality deteriorates and dignity and self-reliance disappears where homes, persons, and possessions are subject at any hour to the unheralded search and seizure by police. So what we're talking about really is the right to privacy and the right of being secure in your home and your possessions against the power of an arbitrary government. Remember, anti-federalists, that's what this is all about. And so, again, the Fourth Amendment does not give citizens an absolute right to privacy, and it does not prohibit searches in all cases. It sets out the right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures by the government, and it establishes conditions where search warrants may be issued, where a magistrate, a judge, overseeing the activities of law enforcement agencies, the police, has to approve beforehand the police's ability to search. Now, this idea of probable cause is what we're after. What is probable cause? Probable cause is a reasonable belief known personally or through reliable sources that a person has committed a crime. Let's say that an officer has enough evidence to lead a reasonable person to believe that the items searched for are connected with criminal activity and will be found in a place to be searched. As an example, an increase of two to three hundred percent in power consumption in a building is in and of itself not enough to establish probable cause to believe that a gr drug growing op operation that's turned into a pothouse is underway. So just the fact that your energy rates have risen two to 300% alone isn't enough evidence to be probable cause that you're growing pot. However, such an instance along with other suspicions or facts, including perhaps let's say an anonymous phone call claiming that people at a certain place are growing drugs. They can smell it coming out. They've added ventilation. They've added irrigation. There are other evidence beyond the jump of power that would be probable cause enough for a search warrant to be issued. So what we're looking at it really is a continuum or an increase going from a lack of probable cause to more probable cause. So in the beginning, you have absolutely no information. Then you have a hunch. Hmm, that house looks suspicious. It's just a hunch, right? It's kind of a, a, an almost innate, inspirational. Then you can have a reasonable suspicion. Reasonable suspicion based on perhaps activities in the neighborhood. Perhaps elements of the house that you can point to and say, well, they did add ventilation. They did add, or they, they've walled up their, their, what is it? A reasonable suspicion. Reasonable grounds takes that to the next level, something much more determinate, something much more subjective. The power went up 2 to 300%. Ah, that's something, that's evidence. But in and of itself, it's not enough. Probable cause, the ventilation, the boarded up windows, the condition of the house, the neighbors saying they smell pot, the 200% increase, these are all coming together to create probable cause that a criminal activity is happening. Then there is a preponderance of evidence. Uh, there's just so much evidence that it's really pointing to. Um, you can still have a reasonable doubt. It could be just something else. But the preponderance of evidence says there's something going on there. Then that there is beyond a reasonable doubt that there is. There is an expectation of privacy. 
The Fourth Amendment applies to search and only if a person has a legitimate expectation of privacy in the place or thing being searched. If not, the Fourth Amendment offers no protection because there are, by no definition, no privacy issues. I'll give you an example, but the courts use a two-part test that are fashioned by the Supreme Court in this case to determine whether at the time of the search a defendant had a legitimate expectation of privacy in the place where things being searched. So if there is an expectation of privacy, this is when the search warrant has to be effective. If there's not an expectation of privacy, you don't need a search warrant. Is, did the person subjectively, actually, expect some degree of privacy? Is the person's expectation objectively reasonable? If I, so you have a subjective expectation. That is, if I have a subjective expectation, I'm thinking about Mike's expectation, my worldview. I had a right to privacy. But if you, looking at my case, are an objective person, you're removed from my world experience, if you look at my case, would you, as a reasonable person, say that I had an expectation of privacy? Only if both questions are answered yes will a court go to the next question, which is, was the search reasonable or unreasonable? A person using a public restroom expects not to be spied upon. There is a subjective expectation of privacy. And most people, including judges and juries, would agree. They would consider that there is an expectation of privacy when you're using the restroom. That, so there would be an objective right to privacy. Therefore, the installation of hidden camera equipment by the police in a public restroom would be considered a search because there ex is an expectation of privacy, both objective and subjective. And so it would be reasonable to subject it to the Fourth Amendment. When a police see a weapon on the front seat of your car, it's not considered a search under the Fourth Amendment because it is very unlikely the person would think that the front seat of a car with windows all around in public is a private place. Now, this is where the subjective objective comes in. Well, this is my car, and it's my front seat. Yeah, that may be your subjective reasoning, but if I'm walking by and I can look in, I have an objective opinion that that's not a private place. I can see in your car, dude. The gun's right there. So even if a person did, society is not willing to extend the, that protection. So again, it's twofold. Does society objectively say that there is an expectation to privacy? If there is, search warrant. If there's not, no search warrant. The exclusionary rule. So if the court finds that a search or seizure was unreasonable, then evidence found in that search cannot be used in the trial of the defendant. So if it was an unreasonable search and the police didn't have a search warrant, any evidence that they find by virtue of that search is inadmissible in court. The exclusionary rule excludes it from evidence. This does not mean that the defendant cannot be tried or convicted, just that the evidence seized in the unlawful search can't be used in that trial. The Fifth Amendment prohibits self-incrimination. Suspects cannot be forced to be a witness against themselves. The burden of proof always rests on the police and prosecutors not on the defendants. This is the rule of law. Subjects must testify if the government, however, guarantees them immunity from prosecution. So again, the full text of the Fifth Amendment reads, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia, when in actual service in time of war or public danger nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be put in jeopardy of life and limb twice, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against themselves, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation." Well, my friends, the history of the grand jury is rooted in that common and civil law of England, well, actually dating back to Athens and pre-Norman England, promulgated by Henry II. The right seems to have been first mentioned in the colonies in the Charter of Liberties and Privileges of 1683, which was passed by the First Assembly permitted to be elected in the colony of New York. Included from the first in Madison's introduced draft of the Bill of Rights, the provision elicited no recorded debate and no opposition. The grand jury is an English institution, 
brought to this country by the early colonists and incorporated into the Constitution by the founders. There is every reason to believe that our constitutional grand jury was intended to operate substantially like its English predecessor. The basic purposes of the English grand jury was to provide a fair method for instituting criminal proceedings against persons believed to have committed crimes. Grand juries were selected from the body of the people, and their work was not hampered by rigid procedural or evidential rules. In fact, grand juries could act on their own knowledge and were free to make their own presentments or indictments on such information as they deemed satisfactory. Despite its broad power to institute criminal proceedings, the grand jury grew in popular favor over the years. It acquired an independence in England free from control by the crown or even by the judges. So its adoption in our constitution as the sole method for preferring charges in serious criminal cases shows the high place it was held as an instrument of justice. And in this country, as in England of old, the grand jury has convened as a body of laymen, of you and I, the common person, free from technical rules, acting in secret, pledged to indict no one because of prejudice and to free no one because of special favor. The Sixth Amendment has ensured the right to, um, has always ensured the right to counsel in federal courts, but this right was not extended or incorporated till the state courts until recently. You have a right to an attorney, right? The Miranda rights. Where does this come from? First, in 1932, the Supreme Court found that if you were indigent, and being faced with a capital crime, in other words, one for which you can lose your life, capital punishment, you had a right to an attorney. We can give you an attorney. 1963, the court extended that right to everyone accused of a felony. And then finally, in 1972, Arsinger versus Hamlin, the court ruled that the lawyer must be provided for the accused whenever imprisonment could be imposed. The Miranda rights that you're familiar with are 1966, where the Supreme Court set guidelines for police questioning. So the police have to let a person know before they're questioned their constitutional rights. And so we know these, you have the right to remain silent, right? That anything you say can be used against you, that you have a right to an attorney present during interrogation, and that a lawyer will be provided if you can't afford one. The Sixth Amendment also guarantees a speedy trial and an impartial jury. So this goes back, the impartial jury goes back to Magna Carta 1215. Right? It was one of those rights um, registered in 1215, where by an impartial jury separating the power of the government to pick you up and throw you in jail to find you guilty is now given to this dispassionate group of individuals, your peers, who, when coming together, have no other association, and after their jury duty, usually have no association going forward. Has anybody ever served in a jury? One? Okay. So before you served on the jury, did you know any of your co-jurors? After the jury disbanded, did you keep in touch? Right. Okay. Exactly. The idea is that you come together to serve the individual as a buffer between the arbitrary forces of the government and throwing them in prison. The death penalty, receiving the sentence of death for a capital crime. The state determines, one, if they have the death penalty or not, and what you can receive the death penalty for. Right? Uh, it also determines the styles of which you would receive the death penalty. In other words, the method of execution. So not all states have the death penalty. Not all states are as ambitious in finding the death penalty or as effective in using the death penalty. However, the federal government still has the authority, by virtue of the Bill of Rights, to make sure that the death penalty, when it's applied, doesn't rise to the level of cruel or unusual punishment. Now, let me just make a quick caveat. The death penalty is not retribution. The death penalty is not revenge. There's no way that the death penalty, putting somebody to death, could ever impose the harm and the suffering that that criminal, whoever they are, if it's true that they actually murdered somebody or whatever in cold blood, that it's not retribution. It's not really meant to be an eye for an eye. It couldn't be. What it is, is the social contract saying that this is a line in the sand. For our purposes, this is a crime that you cannot commit, and the penalty that you will pay in the end is your death. And so the death penalty isn't retribution, it's not revenge, it's justice. 
And there's a big difference. Having said that, because when you get to the idea of the death penalty and how it's affected, last year the Supreme Court came down and put a moratorium on the death penalty when it was affected by lethal injection. Here's the idea. Doctors and nurses, well, doctors primarily, take what's known as the Hippocratic Oath. Right? And the Hippocratic Oath starts with, first, do no harm. Doctors are proscribed by their own code of ethics from using their medical knowledge to hurt people, because they could. You know, they have knowledge, they can use it to, to hurt you, to kill you. So the first thing is, first, do no harm. So a doctor can't use their medical knowledge to administer a lethal injection. It's against the Hippocratic Oath. But then what? So, so if you don't have a doctor administering it or a nurse, who do you got? Oftentimes they use prison guards, right? Or somebody who thinks they have the ability, they get a little extra pay in their paycheck to perform a lethal injection. Now, lethal injections are very complicated. There's actually three elements to it, which you may know. The first element paralyzes you. The second puts you to sleep knocks you out. The third one stops your heart. The question is, the Supreme Court asked, if you're not having a doctor do this, can you assure me that this person is not experiencing undue suffering? The undue suffering would be cruel. If you're not making efforts to make sure that this person isn't suffering more than necessary, then that is, by definition, cruel. Again, the idea of retribution notwithstanding, we already passed that milestone, right? We're just putting them to death. So the constitutional prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment means is, can you, can you assure me that this death row inmate isn't being cruelly treated? You couldn't. Because if a person is first paralyzed and then knocked out, if they're paralyzed, they can't protest. They can't tell you that they're in pain. They can be in searing pain, and there would be no way of knowing that, because they're paralyzed. Exactly. And so the Supreme Court had to make it so that the states could assure them that their processes were sufficient to administer these three drugs adequately to confirm that there is no undue pain. But this is the line in the sand in the social contract. This is what you may not transgress. For whatever reason. And, you know, any state, now this goes to substantive due process, for what w would you lose your life? Surely not spinning your gum in the gutter, right? But each state has their own elements of what you can receive the death penalty for. That's a state's issue because criminal cases are states' rights. Turning then to our last two amendments that constitute the Bill of Rights, the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. So the Ninth Amendment reads... The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people. Okay, so aside from contending that a Bill of Rights was unnecessary, the Federalists responded to those opposing ratification of the Constitution because of the lack of a Declaration of Fundamental Rights by arguing that inasmuch as it would be impossible to list all rights, it would be dangerous to list some because there would be those who would seize in the absence of the admitted rights to assert the government was unrestrained as to those. Madison adverted to the argument in presenting his proposed amendments to the House of Representatives. Quote, it has been objected also against a Bill of Rights that by enumerating particular exceptions to the grant of power, it would disparage those rights which were not placed in that enumeration, and it might follow by implication that those rights which were not singled out were intended to be assigned into the hands of the general government and were consequently insecure. This is one of the most plausible arguments I have ever heard against the admission of the Bill of Rights into the system, but I conceive that it may be guarded against. It is clear from its text and from Madison's statement that the amendment states but a rule of construction, making clear that a Bill of Rights may not, by implication, be taken to increase the powers of the national government in areas not enumerated, and that it does not contain within itself any guarantee of a right or a prescription of an infringement. Recently, however, the amendment has been construed to be a positive affirmation 
of the extents of rights which are not enumerated, but which are nonetheless protected by other provisions. In the Tenth Amendment, reserved powers reads, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So the Tenth Amendment was intended to confirm the understanding of the people at the time the Constitution was adopted that powers not granted to the United States were reserved to the states or to the people. It added nothing to the instrument as originally ratified. The amendment states but a truism that all is retained which has not been surrendered. Well, there is nothing in the history of its adoption to suggest that it was more than declaratory of the relationship between the national and state governments as it had been established by the Constitution before the amendment or that its purpose was other than to allay fears that the new national government might seek to exercise powers not granted, and that states might not be able to exercise fully their reserved powers. Well, that this provision was not conceived to be a yardstick for measuring the powers granted to the federal government or reserved to the states was firmly settled by the refusal of both houses of Congress to insert the word expressly before the word delegated, and confirmed by Madison's remark in the course of the debate. And as we wrap up, before we dive back into our seminar question, I wanted to take an opportunity to encourage everybody, if you're interested in civil, civil liberties, if this lecture has at all got you fired up and wanting to learn more, the American Civil Liberties Union, which is a non-profit organization, seeks to define further and represent people in court on the issue of civil liberties. They are truly nonpartisan, which allows me the opportunity to recommend them to you for further information. Going to their website, aclu.org, under issues, you'll find some wonderful topics like capital punishment, criminal law reform, disability rights, surely free speech and human rights, immigrants' rights, juvenile justice, racial justice, LGBT rights, security, prisoners' rights, privacy and technology, religious liberty, reproductive freedom, justice, voting rights, and women's rights. So as we, as we get into our seminar question, I wanted to give you that resource. ACLU.org is a marvelous place to go to visit and to learn more. Okay, I'll step off my soapbox now. Excellent. Well, thanks, guys. So this is our seminar question again. Our examination of civil liberties helps us appreciate the balance of power that is codified in the Constitution. So how does the existence and the exercise of civil liberties show evidence of structural and procedural balance of power? So how would this be a good uh, piece of statement? Help me out here before you wrap up. So the existence and exercise of civil liberties show evidence of structural and procedural balance of power designed into the social contract of the Constitution. So you have your outline coming. You have your introductory paragraph that holds your thesis statement. Check. Sure. Then you have civil liberties. So paragraphs two and three define civil liberties. Paragraph two define it generally. Paragraph three go into a little more detail. Pick a civil liberty, perhaps, and go into greater detail about that civil liberty. Freedom of speech. Elements of freedom of speech. When can speech be stopped? Elements of the right to assemble, right? how it includes association. Second Amendment, give it to me, right? the absence of a semicolon. Um, and then the structural and procedural balance of power designed into it. So what are the sum of the elements of the structural and procedural balance of power? Structure. We have a national government made up of three branches, and the states and the people, the electorate. right? So remember, your reader knows nothing. So you have to re-educate your reader. You have to educate your reader in the structural balance of power. Paragraph four is defining that. Paragraph five is the procedural balance of power. How does this happen? How does the balance of power happen? The role of the electorate through regular elections, right? That the lower, uh, uh, the lower chamber and the upper chamber and the Senate have to agree. The president can veto a piece of legislation. The, legis the Congress can override a presidential veto. The courts can find it unconstitutional. 
Check. But then what about the states? Oh my stars. So medical marijuana, um, recreational marijuana, uh, euthanasia, the death penalty, these are all issues, right? And so the um, process of balance of power is how the conversation happens, right? How does the conversation about gun control happen? Gun control bills being introduced, the president signing the gun control bill, the president using his oomph, his bully pulpit to get people to, to agree with, to support the gun control bill, the courts finding the gun control bill unconstitutional, both at the national and at the state level, right? So the process. And then as we're wont to do, in your conclusion, you want to take your thesis statement and reiterate it. Again, remember always, it's tell them you're going to tell them, tell them, and tell them you told them. So in your initial paragraph, your introductory paragraph, you are introducing the topic through your thesis statement, through the body of your essay, one by one by one, as I suggest in this outline, you're going to make your argument. And then in the final paragraph, you will conclude. Okay, so that is our seminar question for today's lecture on Civil Liberties, Chapter 4, in Barbara Bards. My friends, as always, if you have any questions, if you'd like any more information or any other resources, I am here to make sure you're successful in this class. I take that very seriously, and I encourage you to email me, text me, call me, whatever. Um, get a hold of me, and let's make sure that you have all the information you need. Having said that, this concludes our lecture today. Next week is Civil Rights. I look forward to reading your essays for today's lecture, Civil Liberties, and thank you again for your forbearance and your patience. Have a great day. This is Mike Corrali with the Introduction to United States Government Online.